Good morning, Crossroads. It's wonderful to be with you this morning. And whether you're online or you're in the East Windsor campus, you are welcome. For those of you who don't know me, I am Fosti Onyerimba. I am the leader or president of the medical missions team. And with me on the stage today is uh, Justine Jackman. She is a critical care nurse. Um, yes. So Justine is not a member of this church, so uh, thank you for giving her a rousing welcome. <laughs> now, she has been with me to Guatemala on two occasions, and this year she was also with us in Peru. I would like her to share her experience with us. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Justine. I'm one of the nurses who has been going on the mission trips with Kami. Uh, this year, as he said, was my first time going to Peru, and it will be my third year going to Guatemala. I first heard about these trips through one of my coworkers who had gone in the past. They were seeking more nurses, and I had always wanted to go on a mission, so I decided to go. Um, I went in honor of my cousin, who was a missionary who had recently passed at that time. Um, these missions have enriched me far beyond whatever I could offer the people that we serve. Uh, the strength and the resilience of those in the communities is awe-inspiring. I have just as much joy and excitement when we're able to give the children little gifts such as stickers or coloring pages than they get from receiving them. Unlike other organizations that shift their locations yearly, Kami returns to the same places annually this continuity allows us to create enduring impacts on the communities that we support. Those who have been going on the trips for longer than I have have been able to see the changes over time that we're able to create. I highly encourage all of you who are able to consider joining us on these next trips. One of the highlights of these missions for me is the morning devotionals in Guatemala. Each day we gather to worship and hear inspiring sermons that set the tone for our day of service. After hearing these devotionals, the entire group sing songs of worship in both English and Spanish. The sense of community and everyone coming together, singing the same songs in their own language is really beautiful. For those who think I'm not a medical professional, so how can I contribute? Let me assure you, your help is invaluable. Our role as nurses is very important. We can always use more medical volunteers, but our non-medical volunteers, such as Olga, are far more important than I am, and we can always use more people to help her organize your church's generous donations. Thank you so much for your time, and I hope to see you in Guatemala this fall. So our recent trip to Guatemala uh, faced so many unforeseen challenges. Uh, we traveled in the uh, midst of the political unrest and rioting, uh, and we nearly canceled the trip. We were also faced with the aftermath of a big hurricane that was unusual in the area. Um, but despite these hurdles, so many people braved the rainfalls, the mudslides, the difficult terrains to come and see us. Uh, overall, about 725 patients, uh, and in four days, there were 1,250 patient encounters. So during this time, we were able to hand out food bags and the clothings that you have donated, and 246 people gave their life to become followers of Jesus Christ. Yeah, that's awesome. Now, I don't want you to forget what we're doing in Peru as a church. You know, we're training 100 pastors um, and building churches for them. Our role as a medical missions team is just to go and support them physically and spiritually in a ministry of encouragement. Now, these pastors will go out to their villages and reach people that we may never see. And I want to remind you that the scripture says that anyone who receives a prophet because he's a prophet will receive the prophet's reward. Or anybody who gives a cup of water to any of these disciples of mine will in no ways lose their reward. So when that day comes, when the pastors line up and be receiving their rewards, you will be there, I will be there. And that is a promise from God. Looking ahead, 
we are prayerfully considering and adding a third uh, country to what we are doing. So we ask you to pray for us, you know, for wisdom, for guidance, and for provision. And once again, thank you for supporting this ministry in the way that you do, because without it, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. If you want to know how you can volunteer to join us, meet us at the atrium. And thank you. So Pastor Sean has asked me to bring the message today. And the title I have chosen is Life That Pleases God. A life that pleases God. If you've been coming to this church for any length of time, you have heard these things many times. I'm just compiling them together. Um, But if you're a new Christian, pay attention. If you're not yet saved, this is an opportunity for you. Now, God's love is often misunderstood in our culture. Um, God's love is unconditional. In other words, you don't have to do anything to merit the love of God. His universal love is rooted in who he is. God is love. He loves you because of who he is, not because of anything you have done. He is the God who causes his son to rise on the just and the unjust and allows rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. He is the God who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have everlasting life. Now, that does not mean that he is pleased with everyone or that everyone will be saved for that matter. His love is unconditional, but his pleasure is conditional. Just as parents love their children and are pleased with certain behaviors and are displeased with others, God has expectations from us. He has given us the free gift of salvation, but we have the responsibility of obedience. Is he pleased with you? Or are your ways pleasing to him? There is someone in the scripture that his ways please God. In Hebrews chapter 11 verse 5, we read that by faith Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken... He was commended as one who pleased God. Enoch was commended as one who pleased God. The story of Enoch can be found in Genesis chapter 5. We learn that he walked with God for 300 years. And he did not compromise. The world in which he lived was similar to the world we live in now. If you look at Genesis chapter 6. God saw that the wickedness of man was great. In all the earth. And that every imagination of his thinking. Was only evil. Continually. That's what we are. So Enoch was in the minority. He was persecuted. But he didn't compromise. Now we know. That the Old Testament. Was not the dispensation of the rapture. God made an exception. For Enoch. And took him out of there. But we're living in the dispensation of the rapture now. We are expecting that Jesus could come back anytime soon. Scripture says that it will be dramatic. It will be a trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise up first. And we who are alive and remain will be caught up with them in heaven. So, are you ready? If the role is called up in heaven today, will you be there? That's the point. The love of God is not an excuse for a careless lifestyle. Everybody will give an account of how they live their life. Now, God makes a distinction between love and pleasure. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, after Jesus was baptized, 
a voice from heaven said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. So you see, I love my son and I'm pleased with his conduct and character. It's kind of like you are affirming your son. You put your hand on his shoulder and you say, Son, I really love you. I am pleased with what you're doing and what you're saying. That's the, the thing, you know. Jesus understood it this way. He said in John chapter 8, verse 29, The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. So almost as if the reason why his father has not left him is that he does what pleases him. Paul encourages us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. He says, So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. Every believer, every true believer should make it our goal to please God. Not just to avoid getting into trouble, but we should make it our goal to please him. Scripture says whether we eat or we drink or whatever we do, we should do it for the glory of God. So that way you are dressed, does it bring glory to God? That invitation you accepted, does it bring glory to God? That website you visit, does it bring glory to God? So that is the standard. God has always made it clear what it takes to please him. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? It includes walking humbly with your God. So I have listed four ways in which we can walk with God to please him. It includes walking by faith, walking in holiness, imitation of God, and walking in integrity. Take faith, for instance. Faith is an English word. It has a meaning. We have faith in all kinds of things. We all have faith that this building is not going to collapse on us. Otherwise, nobody will be here now. So you all have faith. But biblical faith is a confident conviction that God is who he said he is and will do what he said he will do. It is a firm belief that God is real and that he will show up to keep his promises. In Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6, it says, And without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. I find it funny. Anyone who comes to him must believe he exists. Now, God is not looking for a mere acknowledgement of his existence. There are people who go around saying, oh, I know there is a, a higher being somewhere. Wow. Scripture says you believe there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons know that and they tremble. God is looking for a relationship with you that will transform your life. A transformation from above that gives you a new life which we call being born again okay in Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 Paul put it this way I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live but Christ lives in me the life I live in the body I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So you see something happened to Paul. And now he considered his old self. His natural self. Dead. Crucified with Christ on the cross. Have you had that encounter? He said although I am now alive. I live by faith in the son of God. Not by faith in myself. Not by faith in what I can do. But by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I know that Jesus died for the whole world. But did he die for you? Have you made it a personal uh, uh, issue? 
Have you had that encounter with God? There must be a point where you repent of your sins and turn away from it. And by faith, invite Jesus to come into your life. If you have not done so, today is a good day for you. A good opportunity to do so. Scripture says, there is joy in heaven when one sinner repents. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. He died for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. And he invites us to come. Come to him, him alone. All ye who are weary and are burdened. And I, Jesus, will give you rest. Nobody else. A simple faith is all we need. Human effort, no matter how sincere, can never be good enough. Neither will church attendance or church affiliation or dependence of Christian parents. It is faith that gives birth to our redemption. It is also faith that gives value to our redemption. If you look at Hebrews chapter 10 verse 38, it says, but my righteous one will live by faith. If you are born again, you are righteous. My righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. So we're studying what pleases God, even if you're righteous. He's encouraging us not to abandon our faith in difficulty. Instead, we use our faith as a defensive shield. It is by faith we overcome sin. It is by faith we overcome persecution. It is by faith we overcome hardship. It is by faith we receive our healing. It is by faith we fulfill our mandate. Scripture says, according to your faith, be it done to you. So the, 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 the platform for faith is the word of God. The instrument of faith is the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. What we know of him determines our response to him and the level of our faith. It is by studying the word of God that we discover the promises that he has made and his commitment towards us. It is by studying the word of God that we understand his almighty power, the power that created the universe by his spoken word, that we understand the power that raised Jesus from the dead. It is by studying the word of God that we understand the wisdom of God and his faithfulness and his capacity to accomplish what he has promised. Can you imagine if you really believed the word of God? I want you to Make it a daily habit. Study the word of God. Don't just read, study. Write down notes. Dig deeper. Teach someone. If it has to be in you, can you imagine if you get up in the morning and you feel, the Lord is my shepherd? I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. Even if I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no one. That can be you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13, it, is, it says, It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. With that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Now, it was David who wrote in the psalm, I believed, therefore I have spoken. Paul is saying that we have the same spirit that David had. That all the prophet had. It is in us. It is in us. So we believe the word of God. And we speak the word of God. So what are you believing? And what are you speaking? Is it your words? And your opinion? Or are you believing the word of God? Remember he watches after his words. To perform it. Not your word. He's not watching after your word. So don't focus on the environment and all the difficulties and darknesses that you face. Instead, look at the word of God, believe them, and speak them. 
Number two, holiness. In Romans chapter 8, verse 7 to 8, it says, The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. Now, man is never the captain of his own soul. The soul is either controlled by God or controlled by Satan. It is impossible to be neutral. That seat of personal authority was designed to be controlled by God. When man sinned, we turned it over to Satan. And that is how we lost our righteousness. Righteousness really is a legal term. It's right standing before God. We lost our citizenship of the kingdom of God. Or similar to you lost, losing your citizenship in America. Uh, if Jesus did not offer us a way out, all of us would have been in the group who are controlled by our sinful nature, who can never please God. But because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, righteousness has been given to us as a gift. And so we stand forgiven and justified. Now that is positional holiness. Positional holiness. When you're righteous, you're born again, you're holy. You're positionally holy. But that is just the beginning. That's not the end. It is similar to you being married. You find your spouse, you bring her to the altar, you receive blessings, and they give you a marriage certificate. You're married. That's your position now. Now, it's up to you whether you live out your marriage vows or not, or whether you continue to live like a single person and go here and go there and looking for all sorts of things. In the same way, there is behavioral holiness. You have positional holiness. God has made you righteous. Now you have to behave in a holy manner. Okay? Behavioral holiness is our moral character. It refers to our conduct and manner of living. It is a lifestyle of complete surrender and obedience. It is separating ourselves from the world unto God. It is not following our own desires, but following him. I want to say that holiness is not the same thing as sinless perfection. That's not the same. We're humans. Nobody is sinless, sinlessly perfect except Jesus Christ. We're never going to get there on this earth. But God has made a provision for our imperfections. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay? It is God who makes us righteous, which is positional holiness. But we as Christians must endeavor or work to be godly or holy. Behavioral holiness will not happen with no effort on our part. If you don't believe me, look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. It says, Have nothing to do with godless meats and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be holy. Train yourself to be holy. It, it ref suggests that you have something to do with it. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, it says, Make every effort to live in peace with all men, and to be holy. In other words, make every effort to be holy. Then he says, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. So holiness or sanctification can be pursued and developed. It requires discipline and effort. Self-denial is part of our Christian journey. If everybody, anybody will come after me, they must deny themselves. Not fulfilling every desire you have or gratifying every urge or craving. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Now, I don't believe that he is just talking about citing him. Because we know that the scripture says that when he will come, every eye will see him, including those who pierced him. 
So everybody will see him. Every knee will bow that he is Lord. Well, so what does it mean that without holiness, no one will see him? Another verse says, If anyone loves me, my father will love him. I too will love him and show myself to him. Or reveal myself to him. Or manifest myself to him. Without holiness, no one will experience the manifest presence of God. Okay? God is everywhere. Are you experiencing his presence? Is he manifesting himself to you? Ongoing sin will separate us from God. Now, holiness is not optional. It is not for a few Christians. It is not for only the pastor. In Leviticus chapter 19, verse 1 to 2, Scripture says, The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the entire assembly of Israel and say to them, Be holy, because I, the Lord your God, am holy. He didn't say, say to Moses and Aaron, but to everybody. In the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus said, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, this is not a statement of condemnation. It is an encouragement for us to maximize our potential. It is saying, rise above your mediocrity in character. Rise above your mediocrity in holiness. Rise above your mediocrity in maturity. Rise above your mediocrity in love. Perfection is not a destination. There is no place you will get to and you say, I have arrived. I'm perfect. That's why God said to Abraham, walk before me and be perfect. So perfection for a Christian is a walk with God. It's ongoing with God. You make mistakes, you get up, and you keep going. When you receive Christ as your Savior, you begin the process. And then you get better and better. The path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn, shining ever brighter until the full light of day. So when you get born again, that's your morning. You get better and better until Christ returns. Okay? Now, you cannot become what you don't believe in. Scripture says, it's to those who believe that he gave the power to become. As a man thinks in his heart, so he is. If your thinking is, well, I'm only human, nobody is perfect, then that's going to be your standard of holiness. But if you believe that God is calling us to a life of holiness, then that's what you pursue. In Isaiah chapter 35, verse 8, it says, And a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. The unclean will not journey on it. It will be for those who walk in that way. Wicked fools will not go about on it. I know this is hard to swallow, but it is the whole counsel of God. Number three is imitation of God. I'm going to cut this short. God's desire is to mold us into the image of Christ. Jesus is our role model. He's the one who says, I always do what pleases him. So we ought to look at his life. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. If you are a Christian, act like it. Act like it. There are so many attitudes that we can emulate. I'll just mention a few, like obedience. Jesus was our example in obedience. He submitted his will to the will of his father. He said, not my will, but your will be done. In the same way, God has given us free will. And we are free to choose anything we do. The question is, will you submit your will to the will of God in your marriage? In your home? In your workplace? 
in your school, in the church? Are you willing to do that? God is calling us to a life of obedience. He wants our obedience more than anything else. We show that we love him when we obey his commandments. Otherwise, one will say, why do you call him Lord, Lord, if you don't do what he says? Prayer and fasting are important, and we should do them. But they are not substitutes for obedience. If the word of God is telling you to repent and live a certain lifestyle, or live some behavior or habit, and instead you're praying, God, you need to understand, uh, you may be wasting your time. On the other hand, obedience always provokes the flow of God's blessings. If you look at Isaiah chapter 1 verse 19, if you are willing and obedient, you will eat the best from the land. So obey God to please him, not to appease him. That's the willingness. Okay? Okay. How about humility? Jesus washed the feet of his disciples and gave us an example to follow. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Biblical humility is a heart attitude. It's not necessarily an outward appearance. He said, humble yourself before God, not necessarily before man. He's not asking us to walk around feeling miserable and worthless. True meekness and fear of God is knowing that everything we have or everything we are has come from God, not from us. And therefore, no boasting, no pride, because you had nothing to do with it anyway. And so on and so forth. We don't have time to give all the examples. So let me add and with integrity, walking in integrity. Integrity means having strong moral principles and being honest. It is highly valued even in the secular world. Businessman Warren Buffett puts it this way. In looking for people to hire, you look for three qualities. Integrity, intelligence, and energy. And if they don't have the first, the other two will kill you. So in the secular world, moral integrity is highly valued. Many people are moral. Many people are law-abiding. Many people are kind. Not only Christians have good attitudes. But here's the difference. We are called to shine as stars in this crooked and depraved world. Yes. Not every moral person is godly, but every godly person should be moral. Every godly person should be moral. In First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 7, it says, I know, my God, that you test the heart and are pleased with integrity. This is what David says. Jesus knows what we are really like. He searches the, our hearts and mind and will repay each of us according to our deeds. Nothing is hidden to him we must give, uh, give an account. He knows when we are faking it, pretending to be what we are not. He knows when we are playing games, not being serious. He knows when we are blurring the line between what is right and what is wrong, even in your tax return. So the driving force for integrity is the fear of God. There is no holiness without the fear of God. You know, some people love God, but they don't fear him. Some people have faith in God, but they don't fear him. That's another sermon. <laughs> Joseph had a life of integrity and fear of God. And we know the story. Okay, he was a slave in Egypt. He was now a, a slave in Potiphar's house. 
The scripture described him as a handsome man and well-built. And Potiphar's wife took sexual interest in him. And day after day, he approached Joseph. Scripture says he did not want to go to bed with her or even be around her. Instead, he said this in Genesis 39 verse 9. He said, no one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Joseph resisted the temptation because he feared God, not because he feared Potiphar. Because fear of man can easily be rationalized. He could say, well, he's out for the weekend. He will never know. Let's just do it once. He didn't say that. Instead, he ran away from the house half naked. He did not wait to cancel her. He did not wait to convert her to Christianity. He did not wait to see how strong he, Joseph, was. The fear of God kept him. He did not want to sell his destiny for a bowl of porridge. Okay? We know how the story ended. He was imprisoned for what he didn't do. And while there... God revealed Pharaoh's dreams to him. And he ended up in Pharaoh's house becoming a prime minister, a powerful political leader. You see, the secrets of the Lord are with those who fear him. If you want to receive secrets from the Lord, you have to pay the price other people paid. Uh, fear of God, life of holiness... And that could be yours. How about Daniel? Daniel was a man who feared God. His scripture said that he resolved in his heart never to defile himself with the king's wine and food or meat. No bribery. You know, scripture says he was a, you know, he was equivalent of a, of a, 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 a university chancellor, uh, a wise man, very well respected scholar. So you can make it in academia without cutting corners. How about Job? Job was a businessman. In the book of Job, you will see that he was a man who feared God and shunned evil. They listed all his possessions, and they said he was the richest man in the East. Basically, the Elon Musk of his time. So you can be a successful businessman without stealing. Okay? Compare that to the sad story of Ananias and Sapphira in the New Testament. Okay? This is a story of lying and hypocrisy. They pretended to be what they were not. Remember, I said, God knows when you are faking it. They sold their land and kept some of the money for themselves and brought the rest to the feet of Peter, pretending that they were giving him everything. And Peter discerned the lie. And said, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit? And we know that both of them fell down and died. This is in New Testament. They were Christians in a church that was on fire with the Holy Spirit. And yet they behave like this. And so why was it included? All scripture is divinely inspired and is profitable for instruction and for correction and for training in righteousness. It is for you and I to learn and to know how to behave. So let me end with this. When your ways please the Lord, it does not mean that men will applaud you. You may be persecuted. It is, however, better to suffer for doing what is right than for doing what is wrong. Our obligation is to please God and not to please men. He alone deserves our honor and our worship. Now, there are rewards for pleasing God, which I have not gone into today. You can re read and study yourself about that. So stand up and let us uh, go uh,
to God in prayer. I know that all of us want to please God. So let us come boldly to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and help in our time of need. Pray silently for yourself. Pray for mercy. Pray for help. We need mercy for when we fall short. We need help to walk with God. We need help to walk by faith. We need help to walk in holiness. We need help to be like Christ. And we need help to walk in integrity. Father, thank you for your word has gone forth. For when we pray according to your will, Lord, we know that you hear us. And when you hear us, we know that we have what we have asked for. I pray for everyone here today. Father, Lord, that we may live a life worthy of the call that you have placed in us. I pray that we may please you in everything that we do. I pray that we will continue to bear fruit in every good work. And I pray that we will continue to grow in the knowledge of who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen Amen. and amen. Amen. So the leaders may come forward. Uh, The altars are open. And you can come forward to pray. Um, If you are... You have not given your life to Christ. This is an opportunity for you to do so. If you want to recommit to God, please come forward. If you want to bring your burdens for anything, please come forward. You took my place, laid inside my tomb of sin. You were buried for three days. But then you walked right out again And now death has no sting And life has no end For I have been transformed By the blood of the Lamb Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied Thank you God, we praise your holy name in this place, Lord. We thank you for your word. Father God, we pray that that the work that you have began today, that you would continue to completion, that your Holy Spirit would continue to work inside us, God, that the things that you have placed in our heart, that we wouldn't forget them, Father God, that we would allow you to do your work to get rid of us, God, and to give more of you in our lives, Father. We press in today, God. We say, have your way in our lives, God. May we pursue holiness, God. May we pursue more of your spirit and less of this world. God, thank you for meeting us here today. We praise you, we honor you, and we worship you this morning, Lord. And all God's people said, amen. 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 Listen, thank you for worshiping with us today. 
These altars will remain open if you want to come and pray. If you have to go, go in peace and the Lord be with you.